Welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and the Disaster Recovery Journal. Crisis management in today's world is ever-changing, and this podcast is our commitment to help you navigate successful outcomes for any crisis you may face. I'm your host, Vanessa Matthews. I specialize in providing insights and solutions for crisis, continuity, and resilience across industries from real estate and healthcare to terrorism in the airline and transportation worlds. No matter what industry you're in, this podcast will provide you the tools to build resilience in your organization. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Resilience Decoded podcast. Today, I'm super excited as our topic is supply chain resilience in the wine and spirits industry. Our guest today is John Luizzi. He's a National Director of Business Continuity with Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. How are you doing today? Good to see you. Good to chat with you today. I appreciate uh, appreciate you inviting me on and happy to to converse with you, share some ideas about our our continuity planning and and within our industry. So thank you very much. Absolutely. So as a little bit of a backdrop, uh, John has served in the disaster recovery space for the IRS for about 11 years before he transitioned into his current role in the beverage space. And so I'm really excited to kind of talk a little bit more about the transition, uh, what you're seeing across different industries, and then of course, all things supply chain t- today. So first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about how you did that transition from DR to business continuity and what it was like going from the financial services world into wine and spirits. Well, to be honest with you, Vanessa, what it really was is I came to the end of my my terms of office at the IRS. I was a congressional appointee, right? So, you know, in completing that, and a lot of my responsibility at the IRS was not only disaster recovery, but it was also business continuity, continuity of government, continuity of one of the critical assets of the of the uh, of the entire U.S. government. So, as a result, you know, got exposure to so many people and and processes and things like that and just understanding how the government operates and all the homeland security requirements so it was really an interesting 12 years i would say when i was there associated with it It just you know i i I can't can't tell you all the things that i i learned that i was exposed to just being part of that incredible organization just being part of the government and being just understanding and getting a real understanding of what continuity really meant because that you know on a national level it just takes a whole different level of of planning and and what you have to do and thinking through you know what's what's involved with that especially you know being involved with the IRS being around the Treasury Department uh, continuity of government is really important to have the money uh, continuity of money flow throughout the U.S. economy right is really an important aspect of the whole planning and continuity for the government so it just taught me so much and it gave me such a uh, want to be able to kind of do that. And I had a great team of people that work with me. I, I can't say enough good things about the work, the folks that work with me at the IRS, the Treasury Department, and so many other government agencies, because I was also involved with the cybersecurity aspect of it, uh, associated with uh, managing incident response for that, and then just overall the exercises that we did. So, you know, overall it was just a fabulous experience, I'll tell you that. And you know, just coming out of there was like, hey, you know something, I really want to kind of, I love the continuity aspect of things, just kind of want to do something a little bit different, and was actually looking for an opportunity where I could start something from scratch, where it was a company that did not have any continuity program in place associated with that. And I got this opportunity that came through and said, hey, John, I got your dream job. And, you know, went through all, went through the, you know, the, the, the recruitment process, stuff like that. But it essentially was my dream job. It was an organization that was very, very successful, a leader in what their industry was, but they really struggled with and hadn't really built a continuity program. They were looking for an organizational leader to do that. So here was a great opportunity to take all that expertise that I had learned on such a grand scale and working with the government and being able to take that and put it in place associated with that and build out a program, bring on, bring on whatever resources I need uh, for the what is the largest and you know, the largest and most successful uh, wine and spirits distributor in the world. So just uh, just an amazing you know opportunity for me in a transition. It's been ten years now. I could tell you I have what I would say I would have I have a business continuity dream job. So it's not only because I'm sitting here in in, in South Florida, just so as you can see, right? <laughs> um, but I get to do that as well. But the whole idea is that. The people that I work with are just the best. I, I'll, I'll tell you that. I mean, you know, I hear a lot about business continuity professionals that struggle with executive support. I do not have that problem at all. The folks here are so engaged and so helpful in being able to try to provide a, the best world-class program that we have here. 
the tools that we have, we've been given the systems that we have, the investments that we were able to make. I, I've been able to hire a world-class team of professionals. If you added up all the experience of, of my team, he made that a part of my program. We have over 160 years of experience. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's like the dream team of business continuity. And I, so I'm so, I'm so incredibly honored to be sitting here and, and being able to manage this program because it really has truly been a great role. And I, like I said, I have one of the business continuity dream jobs. So. That is awesome. So I'm going to take you back to what you shared sure. in the beginning. So you talked a little bit about how much you learned from working with the federal government. Uh, and to your point, Ensuring that there is a contingency plan for the Treasury Department is, as an American citizen, one of the most important things, right? We work in local government and state government, and sometimes there's varying levels of continuity throughout the organization. And so I guess my question for you is, what do you think is driving continuity planning and the, and the focus on it at the federal level? And how have you also seen that maybe translated or maybe not translated in the private sector? Well, what's driving it at the federal level essentially is just all the, the risks and the threats to, you know, not only just, you know, extremist organizations and things like that, but it's also threats of global economy, threats of things like, you know, the war in the Ukraine and things like that. I mean, there's so much what I would call uncertainty in the world right now that uh, forces you know, government leaders to pay more attention associated with being able to make sure that, you know, can this particular process or this entity continue through those situations? And again, like I said, there's kind of more uncertainty in the world right now than there has been in a, in a, in a long time. So it's, it's driving this, you know, and you're seeing more and more, you know, natural disasters, unfortunately, right? And you're seeing economic issues, you're seeing political unrest, you're seeing cyber situations, ransomware situations, large organizations, governments, hospital systems, all these, all these, you know, what I would call critical infrastructure, you know, are being now attacked in so many different ways that never occurred before, right? So there's, there's, there's such a broader scale of risk threats associated with it. So hence the need for more and more proactive continuity planning. Got it. Love that. So let's transition a bit to talk about supply chain risk. And the industry that you're in, and especially in COVID, we we work with a mixed beverage retailer, uh, and and the product that you offer became critical, right? <laughs> and and so my question for you is, what are some of the greatest risks, specifically from a supply chain perspective, that you're seeing in your industry? Of course, you know the risks, natural disasters, any type of extreme weather are always something that potentially could interrupt our supply chain, right? Then there's all the old man-made disasters, workplace violence type of situations potentially is another risk that we look at as well. Technology complexity, outages, integrations, those type of thing, you know, the system, the world's becoming more and more plugged in together. So there's always issues associated with compatibility and integrations associated with data and making sure that you know, we understand the exact data that that's being, you know, th through the systems, right? Uh, availability of resources, whether that's labor, raw materials, fueling. I mean, fueling is also an issue as well. Cost of cost of fueling right now is as high as it's ever been, right? Information security, ransomware, that type of situation. Cyber attacks are, are obviously obviously on the rise, impacting all different types of organization, all different sizes of organization. Critical infrastructure failures, you know, things like power outages, that type of thing. There's volatility in financial markets that are impacting uh, cost of goods, right? There's uh, inflation, you know, financial instability. There's your geopolitical, your wars, your civil unrest that are going on. I can tell you one of, the, one of the questions that I've gotten most frequently is people have asked me, hey, John, how does the war in the Ukraine impact the supply of vodka in the United States? <laughs> so to kind of give you an idea, people are starting to think of a global scale. They're worried about their next martini, right, associated with it. But it's uh, what is those type of things that are, you know, that are driving, you know, some of the risks. And then you have government policy regulation and those type of things that continue to happen. And then then there's consumer demands and, mm -hmm. and, and, and perceptions and attitudes. You know, people shift from wine, they shift to, you know, harder liquor, that type of thing. During COVID, what was interesting is the fact that because people couldn't go out to a restaurant and get that Grey Goose martini. What we saw from a trending perspective is people went out and bought better spirits at home and drank them from home. So previously they wouldn't go out and get that those higher end spirits associated with that. They would drink you know kind of lower end brands at home because they had those when they went out. Now what happened was they actually went out and bought better brands and had those at home. So it was kind of you know shifting of demand, knowing the fact that. You know, all the restaurants and bars and those type of thing were, were, were closed down for a, for a long period of time. So 
those are some of the things that you know we look at and we track my team we track all those type of risks on a daily basis associated with that so from our supply okay. chain perspective so a couple of questions for you there so great example about vodka we were in uh mexico with a, a, a customer and they were talking to us about the tequila plant and mm -hmm. how it's a seven-year you know process so from you it sounds like not only is the distribution channel an area of risk, but the raw material is also a risk from a supply chain perspective. Is that accurate? Oh, no question about it. I mean, if 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 our suppliers can't manufacture their product because there's a shortage of raw material in there, and, and that's less product for us available to be able to put to market, right? So, I mean, we're the guys in the middle, right? So we're this, essentially the ones between suppliers and 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 the WalMarts and the and on any other type of you know bars, restaurants, those type of things, and the cheese cheesecake factories and all the bars and you know, all those things like that. So. So we're the ones that supply them. So if we're not able to supply a certain type of tequila because of there's an issue with the supplier down in Mexico, then guess what? That's just one one less product we have to sell in our portfolio when we actually, you know, our salespeople meets with uh, our different customers. So yeah. so yeah, so it's in their best interest to have a continuity plan because it's their product that essentially is no longer part of our portfolio if there's an interruption of it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and so my other question for you is you just rattled off like 30 risks, right? From financial to supply chains, manufacturing to natural disasters, a lot of which you don't control, some of which you may have a little bit of control over. And then if you look at your portfolio from a supply chain perspective, it's international. So Correct. question for you is what, what are the tools that you and your team are using to give you line of sight and visibility for all those different things that, that are happening? We have situational awareness tools. So first of all, I, I monitor the weather throughout the entire world, right? Because that impacts our, our, our supply chain overall because you know, there's a lot of product. We ship from over different 40 different countries worldwide and, and there's various methods how that product makes it to us here in the US. And you know those coming from overseas are coming via ship and those type of things, they're coming into different ports in the United States. So we look at, you know, is there port outages? Is there strikes and things like that that go on in different ports that may delay a product uh, being delivered to us. Is there a, like if, when there's a hurricane, it's gonna hit the Gulf, right? That's gonna impact whatever's being, whatever's being imported into the US through that, through those ports, that type of thing. But, you know, that's the way we, we look at, and then from there we have all kinds of other situational intelligence associated with, you know, what's going on, is, is there ransomware attacks? Are there different, you know, what type of infrastructure is being attacked associated with that? I mean, so whether we have weather systems, I have situational tools, that provide you know, threat intelligence over a hundred different types of threats that we use. I mean, we have various different platforms that are part of our, our, of our program. You know, they're from Everbridge, they're from NC4, they're from you know, Data Miner and some of that we do. So we, we now do social media monitoring as well. That's a critical part of what we need to do because it's not only about those threats that are inherent, but there's also potential social media threats out there and people, you know, reputational issues associated with people saying things potentially about our customers, but about us or about even our suppliers. So, so the world of the threat world continues to expand. So therefore we need to continually invest in the tools and put the resources behind being able to interpret that data. And so speaking upon that, right, the threat landscape is, doesn't look like it's slowing down at any time soon. I think my last time I saw you, you were talking about you two, you know, building a succession plan and making sure that your team has the capabilities and the experience that John has, right? So question is, how do you train your staff and what does that development look like so that as the threat landscape continues to increase, the people on your team can also continue to expand their uh, knowledge and capability? It's really simple. It's just being able to having them exposed to the same threats that I have. I mean, it's not like I try to keep certain information to myself. It's like, hey, here's all the things that are essentially potentially impacting our organizations. And then let's talk about how we would address those things, because you know, there's so many things that come in and a lot. Most of it, thankfully, is noise. But there's some of it that we actually have to pay attention to and be able to have some type of you know response strategy associated with that. So. So it's my job to make sure that they're exposed to what information is available, what sources are available as well, and what type of information comes in, what type of threats, and then let's let's talk about, let's collaborate on, hey, how would we manage this particular situation? 
right now we're, we're my team is really in the middle of developing a whole bunch of very robust what i would call incident response plans so when this situation happens this is what we do i mean so it's, it's kind of take turn it into muscle memory if you know what i mean it's, it's essentially yeah. so that it's easy to understand okay if this happened okay we do this this happened we do this i mean and because we have to get better at that because there's so because there's so much diversity of all these different types of threats there's no way you can kind of remember all those things so as they come about we want to learn from them and put our protocols in place and put, you know, put something like a repeatable process in place. I love that. So you, you also talked about, and I've heard you share this before, access or buy-in or support from executive leadership is not something that your program has had to struggle with, which is what it should be, right? So that's, right. that's the standard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yes. my question for you, well, well, here's my observation. Based on all the threats that you all are managing, I would imagine that your partners in the business would be sales or marketing because the the things that you're seeing from a threat monitoring perspective has the potential to impact that group. It could potentially impact your finance and accounting team. It could potentially impact your legal or your uh, government affairs groups, right? Your operations teams. So my question to you from a communication standpoint up and across what are the two or three things that you and your team have done well so that as you sit across the aisle from those partners, that they're able to receive the information that you're giving them so that it, it actually really helps them make it a better informed decision about their, their, their line of business or their function? Well, what we do is when information is first received to me and my team, we, 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 we then evaluate it, associated, okay, so what is this? How is it going to impact us? specifically, you know, what is the actual threat? And then from there, figure out exactly, okay, so do we have to respond to this? I mean, so we go through an evaluation process to basically, you know, try to understand all the details. And then from there, you, all the folks that you described when you, when you were talking about it, those, that's my crisis management team. That's the folks that I would, I would escalate that information to and say, hey, this is the situation. This is what we're dealing with. So what what comes back to me is okay, John. What are we going to do about it? Which is the right, which to be honest, which is the right thing. My my organization would rather hear about a situation from me than to hear about it from CNN. Yeah. So 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 they've given me the tools to be able to be on the front lines of getting that information first, so that we can be very proactive about you know what's the impact to us, John, and more importantly, what are we going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And from there, and then from there, it's 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 the onus is on my organization to provide leadership associated. Okay, this is how we're going to respond to this situation. I'll never forget the first day of COVID because my boss said to me, and I'll never forget where I was standing when he said it to me. He said, "John, this is yours. This is a business continuity issue. Tell me what you need to be successful with this with this situation." So, in a lot of companies, they struggle. Where did COVID actually live associated with from a leadership perspective? There was no doubt about that from day one where it was, and it was a business continuity issue. And for the next 750 days, they were 100% behind me associated with being able to manage COVID. I love that. So you bring me to another question. So sure. in most organizations that we partner with, the chief operating officer or the head of supply chain, you know, typically has the PL responsibility for the supply chain, right? And, and so from your perspective, what is the number one investment that you would recommend chief operating officers or heads of supply chain to really focus on for the next year? For for business continuity purposes? Or managing supply chain risk? Uh, situational intelligence. I mean, I think as much intelligence as you can build and more integration into your supply chain so that there's good communication to sit with all your partners, I think that's the highest priority. And that's where we've seen the best, what I would call return on our investor, right? Because the fact is, is that if we understand what our suppliers, you know, what's impacting our supply chain, we can respond to it quicker and be able to put any type of you know, mitigation associated with that or alternative strategies. But the integration of systems, like I know that we're working closely with a lot of our suppliers to have our, our systems are integrated. We're passing data back and forth all day long associated with that, right? And so the more intelligence that we have about what's impacting their business as well as what's impacting our business potentially, and then you take a look at, okay, so what about the business content? Hey, John, you got any threats associated with you know this particular you know supply chain line? Then if we can combine that communication you know, we essentially can can manage our supply chain a lot more effectively. 
Love that. So last question for you. Are there any other aspects of supply chain resilience that you think it'd be important for our listeners to know? I, I think it really starts with just understanding what your requirements are, right? And being being involved with it from, from day one and, and realize that every supplier, one size does not fit all. So, you know, you have to be able to kind of prioritize your suppliers and make sure that, you know, as you work with them through the contractual process and all that, that you, you constantly are, are embedding business continuity requirements in, you know, look for evidence that there's actually a program in place, right? And you know, as well as understand, you know, is it being managed by professionals like, like us? I mean, is, is there a framework that, they're, that they're, they're adhering to, that type of thing? You try to understand some of the fundamentals of how they're trying to build their program. It'll give you a sense of, you know, confidence associated with whether or not the supplier, you know, given a, a type of situation is going to be problematic associated with, you know, interruption of, of products or services, that type of thing. I mean, it's really just doing the, the due diligence and the work and being able to ask the right questions associated with being able to just try to understand. Um, and, and the thing about it, though, is that if you if you really develop a really good relationship with your supply, you know, your supplier, because we're all in this together. Right. So, you know, whether it's it happens to my supply chain happens to me. Right. So it's, it's kind of the, you know, we're kind of a, we're actually sharing this, this risk associated with that. I mean, doing that creates a more intimate relationship where you can actually have further business opportunities. Cause now what there's, there's more trust and there's more information sharing going on back and forth between us. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, that, that, that's a good thing for everybody's business. So. John, how can people stay in touch with you? They, and I am 100% anybody free to contact me at any point, any point in time. I, I really enjoy talking to, to folks like yourself as, as I know you and I've chatted many times and had, had been on several po podcasts and webinars together, but I, I'm on LinkedIn. Please feel free to anybody who wants to link me there or just, you know, send me an email at Southern Glazers, John Louisi at, 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 at sgws.com. But uh, I am here to help anyone that I can share some of the experiences that I've had and some of the successes that I've had in my career, as well as just here at Southern Glazers. And uh, I can say it's been, uh, I, I'm really honored to be where I am right now. And I have one of those dream jobs. And I, I, I can say that, uh, you know, whatever I could do to help share and, and build the next, what I would call the next generation of continuity plans. I think that that's part of what my mission is as well. And not only just being able to you know, help my organization grow at this particular point in time. So feel free to share my information with everyone, anybody that I can help. Well, thank you, John, for your time. And thank you listeners for tuning in for this episode. Look out for the next one. Thank you for listening to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and Disaster Recovery Journal. Make sure you check out the show notes for this episode to see all the upcoming events, programs, and ways we can support you. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast, leave us a review, and share it with a friend. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.